Good afternoon. It's such an honor being here at the Google headquarters in Hyderabad and sharing my perspectives on creating purpose-oriented organizations in the millennials' mandate. Let me begin by sharing a story that often inspires me. The story is about us and how we, as these human beings, use our limbs and organs in perfect harmony to achieve our workaday personal and professional targets. For example, let me take a very simple instance of us wanting to pluck a fruit from the tree. We see the fruit, we get inspired, we walk that distance, maybe bend down in the olden days, pick up a stone, throw at the fruit, let the fruit fall, bend down again, wash it, bite it, chew it, let it go in. The sweet juice and the pulp goes to the stomach, the enzymes digest it, the arteries spread the blood and the nutrition to all parts of the body, and what we have is a healthy body. Now, which single organ or limb was responsible for contributing to the health of the human body in the example I just shared? We cannot identify a single organ or a single limb which played an important role. When all the organs and limbs played their respective roles well, was the human body able to enjoy as well as remain healthy? I believe what applies to the micro system of a human body can also apply to the macro system of the world at large. And the various limbs and organs that this macro system has, if they work in unison with a common purpose, how we can have a healthy global body. Let me take you through my story of a millennial before I get into the details of how purpose-oriented organizations have been created and successfully. The school days of most millennials in this room witnessed a lot of change in India. We moved from thumbs up and limca to Coke and Sprite. We moved from Fiat to Ford. We moved from DD Metro to ZTV and Star Channels. We moved from the Bank of Baroda's and the State Bank of India's to the HDFC's and ICICI banks. I still remember very palpably that change happening right in front of our eyes. I remember going to college and studying commerce and business, economics, and the history of how our freedom struggle and subsequent to that brought forth two different economic paradigms. Cause being a grandson of a freedom fighter who spent two years in jail for Quit India movement gives me a lot of satisfaction when we see a thriving democracy today. There were two clear streams of economic development. One was the Gandhian approach, which believed in Sarvodaya, or the benefit of the last person in the line. And the other was the Nehruvian approach, which kept the public sector center stage. And we modeled ourselves on Soviet Russia, till a point in time that Soviet Russia ceased to exist. We also got into this frenzy of nationalization of banks, licensing, and all of that, a very aggressive taxation system. And in my study, I discovered that between 62, 1962 and 1973, taxes in India increased from 75% to 97.5%. To add to that wealth tax, the net tax rate was 105%. So for every 100 rupees you earn, you end up paying 105 rupees tax. That was the kind of extremes we went to. And that gave birth to what we call now the black economy. We also saw a lot of transition post the liberalization. In 1991, after 45 years of our existence, liberalization finally set in. The structural scaffolding of a socialist economy was removed, and India opened up for the benefit of having multinationals enter this country. I remember when the Bombay Stock Exchange first crossed 5,000 point, 5,000 balloons were left into the sky from the terrace of the Jijabai Tower in Bombay. Today we are seven times that, and the growth is still not ended. We are, we are up, up, and going ahead. There was also a time where the IT bubble in the US was at its peak, and we had some of these companies which were considered super successes, 
and had some fantastic market valuations. But in 18 months, the bubble burst, and what we had was a loss of $5 trillion on NASDAQ. We thought that would be the destination for all our talent. But things did change, and once that concluded, another set of companies came into the limelight. And this was the kind of Enron and the power companies, which had fantastic revenue of about $111 billion at its peak. And when the skeleton started tumbling from their cupboards, it was realized that they had indulged in every possible malpractice that could form an encyclopedia of what one should not do while doing business. Effectively, their share price tumbled from $90 per share to a few cents, and most of the senior leadership was jailed. I thought this happens only in the US, India is better, and so, I was progressing with my MBA, and that's when I discovered that the brother of Enron was here in Hyderabad, Satyam Group, the company which was acknowledged with the Golden Peacock Award in corporate governance, revealed finally that it had committed a fraud of 5,000 crores. The rest is history. The corporate governance standards in India have changed since then. But the business researcher in me was shattered. I thought, is this all that business is about? Does it mean that we need to make money at the cost of everybody who contributes to the success of the business, and only those who are contributing financially end up benefiting, and all others are left high and dry? I came across this book by the dean of Harvard College, Professor Kurana, which said, from higher aims to hired hands, and captured the devolution of management education in the US, which started with higher aims of what managers can do for the economy, and ultimately ending in producing hired hands, which can be used for creating lots of profit for corporations. That's when I first started studying that corporations need to be looked at from a multi-stakeholder lens. I studied business history and I realized that over 3,000 years, Chanakya, Aristotle, and Adam Smith from India, Greece, and Europe gave the same message that when economic and ethical interests coalesce, societies and corporations can remain afloat and contribute in a substantial measure. It was for that reason probably that Adam Smith, who is considered the father of modern economics, first wrote the theory of moral sentiments in 1757, and then wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Unfortunately, modern day economists focus only on the second book, and the first part has been forgotten. I went out and interacted with over 200 subject experts, industry captains, business leaders across the globe. And the most important point which was emphasized was this. Capitalism is the greatest system of social cooperation ever invented. It's about how we cooperate to produce that which no single person can produce in isolation. Profits are an outcome of this process. To say that profits are the purpose of business is like saying making red blood cells is the objective of the human body. My, result, my research led to my contribution in the form of three books, which were introduced just now. And each of them have built on this ideal and communicated that business is not a zero-sum game. We are always taught that business means you at my cost or me at your cost. Can't we coexist? Can't we have win-win solutions to business problems such that both of us can succeed? The main problem is that a complex, a complex activity like a business organization has been reduced to a mathematical equation benefiting just a single stakeholder, which is the shareholder. When this objective changes, will we see a lot of difference in our approach to the way we do business? Coming to the contemporary times, this decade, and I'll tell you why I'm sharing this story right up front. India is likely to be a larger economy than the US by 2030, as per a later Standard Chartered report, with an economy of 
46.3 trillion dollars at purchasing power parity, US at 31 trillion, and China at 64.2 trillion. Over 100 crore Indians will enter the middle class out of the total 400 crores in the world, which means every one of four middle class people in the world would belong to India. And the per capita income will increase five times from the current $1,500 to $7,500. So what we see is a phenomenal increase in scale, size, capacity, and ambition. Fabulous. Can corporation ask for anything better? But how will we achieve this and remain there so that as predictions by one great industry captain recently, Mr. Adi Godaret suggest that by 2050, India would even beat China and become the world's largest economy. This is surprising for many millennials, and it was for me too, till I came across a report by OECD, which said, because for long years we were always made to believe that India can grow only at the Hindu rate of growth, which is taught in the colleges, in the commerce textbooks, in economics textbooks. But the OECD study revealed that between 1 AD and 1750 AD, there was one economy which was contributing 35% of the global economic growth. Which economy was that? India. Between 1750 and 1850, it came down to 25%. And between 1850 and 1950, India's contribution came down from 25% to 5%. And Britain's contribution went up from 5% to 25%. Interestingly, when Lord Clive Lloyd, uh, Lord Clive, uh, Robert Clive uh, attacked Murshidabad in the Battle of Plassey in 1757, he was amazed at the affluence of Murshidabad, which was far greater than that of London in 1757. So you can imagine the kind of economic progress India had made in those years. But the resilience and the kind of entrepreneurial capabilities that we have, within 100 years of political independence, India has got the opportunity to bounce back. And by 2050, we'll be again going back to contributing the maximum, along with China, about 50% of the global economy would be contributed by India and China. But what can mar this growth story are the social indicators. Let me share some of them with you in some of the key areas as to why purpose and profits need to go together. What are some of them? Let us take healthcare. 45 million children under the age of 5 are stunted in India. One fourth of the global tuberculosis cases occurred in India, and around 220,000 deaths are recorded every year. Almost 6% of India's GDP, according to the World Bank, is lost due to adverse economic impact of the costs connected with lack of proper health care and sanitation. Let us look at education. In the Prosperity Index of 2016, India ranked 102, much behind its developing country peers like Malaysia, China, Sri Lanka, and Mexico. In terms of skills, we have the largest youth population in the world but only 2.3% of the Indian youth, which is almost a 100 crore population, have been provided some kind of skills. You talk about gender justice and empowerment. Even today, 2,000 girls are killed every single day, some just before their birth and some immediately after that. Compared to the literacy rate of men, women are about 20% behind. Let's see environmental degradation. 10 out of the top 20 cities in the world which are most polluted are in India. Recently, 15 of the most hot in terms of the temperature cities in the world were in India alone in the last week. That's the kind of impact that environment degradation is creating, is we're facing that. Villages, you'd be amazed to know the kind of income that our villagers have. Across 17 states, it was found that the income of farmers, annual income, and I'll, I'll come down directly to the daily income, is about 55 rupees per household of five, which is about 11 rupees per person. 
for the whole day. That's the kind of income they have. Slums. Almost 8 crore Indians live in slums and this is a recorded number. There is a far larger uh, set of people who are not even recorded as to their staying in the slums. And almost 14 out of 1000 girls living in slums reach class 10. So what are we staring at? If we are going to be economically super successful, we are staring at social inequities of such huge scale that that economic growth is not going to be sustainable. Here I share with you the 2013 figures which show that almost 4.25 billion people in the world are at the base of the pyramid earning less than US dollar 5 per day. 4.25 billion people. This by the time it's 2035 would move to the stomach of the diamond. It will no longer be an economic pyramid, it will be an economic diamond. And these 4.25 billion people would move to the core, the stomach of this diamond. If this has to be made possible and sustainable, there is a great opportunity to create purpose-oriented organizations. Now, why do I need to mention the name of millennials? Because the millennials are far more conscious for incorporating purpose orientation in businesses along with profits. A study suggests that 75% millennials would take a pay cut to work for a socially responsible company. And 76% consider a company's social environmental commitment before deciding where to work. By 2025 in India alone, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. So we will no longer be the emerging cohort in corporations. We would be the main cohort in corporations as the movers and shakers of business organizations. So now going to the next part, which is what is important is for the millennials as per their own passion and commitment is to have organizations which have a double bottom line. Profits with purpose and making money along with having a mission. I'm going to share with you how some of these very, very unique purpose-oriented organizations have been created across India and some other parts of the world and what we can learn from them as to how profits and purpose can coexist in several industries and sectors and what does it take for millennials to learn from them in order to replicate that in whichever way we think as entrepreneurs, as managers, as tech experts or just as members of this global society to make a difference so that these inequities that we see along with the fantastic economic opportunity can be possible in a very balanced way. These are the six areas and I'll take you through each in brief. First is the example of purpose embedded in the corporation's existence. For long, social enterprises were considered as those which are supposed to be doing good. Whether they make profit or not is inconsequential. And we usually used to consider them as those that are giving doles so that a particular section of society can benefit. That paradigm is changing. Not recently, but for several decades there have been several entrepreneurs who have been trailblazers in this area. Let me give you the example of this social enterprise in Rajasthan called Jaipur Rugs. Many of you may have heard about it. Many of you may not. I'll share in brief the story of Jaipur Rugs and its founder, Mr. Chaudhary, who is lovingly called Bhai Sahab, which means brother in the Hindi language, he started his business in 1978 in the courtyard of his house in Churu in Rajasthan, which is incidentally among the hottest towns in India, crossing 45 degrees centigrade during summer. With a nominal loan of 5,000 rupees from his father, he started with two looms and nine weavers. Forty years later, he now has 7,000 looms and 40,000 artisans helping him in his rug business where the products are sold across 40 countries. How does he do it? By empowering the artisans. Let me briefly run you through that. The women in these villages are provided an opportunity to be trained, given a stipend, training is free. After being provided with a stipend and learning how to make rugs, they end up earning between three to 14,000 rupees a month. I just shared with you what is their usual earning on a monthly basis. 
ensuring that it doesn't remain a social enterprise where people buy these products because of some kind of love for humanity, they decided that the sustainability of the business will depend on how much the customer centricity aspect is embedded into the business. So they ensured that the rugs, which are long lasting products, are of such high quality that customers are able to enjoy that for several decades. So they used very high quality bamboo, yarn, silk, etc. and priced their products in a premium way so that you get high quality branded products. They also had another category of products for the value conscious customers. They engage with international designers so that you have designer rugs. They used IT to ensure that they are able to trace the quality problems to the grassroots. All in all, they ensured that the entire organization is run in a fashion that is sustainable and profitable. Because if these 40,000 artisans need to be continuously provided with that kind of economic empowerment, the customers who are buying the products in the 40 countries need to continually be interested and invested in this particular company. The work of Jaipur Rugs highly acknowledged as one of the finest organizations working towards empowering the base of the pyramid. And they were also uh, studied by University of Michigan Ross School of Business for integrating these rural artisans in the supply chain. Let me take you through another example. This is of the Jain irrigation system. A similar kind of a background, this gentleman called Bhau, Bhavarlal Jain, started his journey in Maharashtra. He wanted to contribute to the well-being of the farmers. And for that, he took a loan of 7,000 rupees from his mom and started with the objective of helping the farmers at the subsistence level in order to ensure and boost their productivity, both in terms of qualitative and quantitative output. In 1983, he discovered the use of micro-irrigation systems. He ensured that the farmers are acquainted with that, especially at a time where 140 million hectares in India are still dependent on rains, which is 55% of Indian agriculture is still dependent on the benevolence of the rain gods. By using the micro-irrigation systems, the farmers would be able to provide more crop per drop and also were groomed into better utilization of fertilizers. Not just that, he wanted the farmers to get into the global food value system, value chain. So he ensured that you purchase the products that the farmers make in the form of concentrated and dehydrated products, vegetables, fruits, and then provide these to Nestle, Coca-Cola, and other food and beverages companies so that the farmers have a regular sale of their products and they are not just dependent on an uncertain buyer for their high quality products. A lot of training, a lot of hand holding, a lot of acquisitions, and today Jain Irrigations caters to over 8 million farmers across the world through 11,000 distributors. And you'd be surprised to know that Jain Irrigations is the largest, and I've, I've uh, uh, made a note of what it is. Jain Irrigation is the second largest irrigation company working towards providing total crop solutions to small as well as marginal farmers in the United States of America. That's the kind of scale and scope they have achieved, but they didn't just end at that. They created a trust so that eventually the benefit of the farmers continues to be a priority for the family in the subsequent generations, and this trust would ensure that farmers' well-being is integrated into the business's priorities for the future. Purpose achieved through commitment to the supply chain. You may not always be able to have a business which is fully focused on integrating the interests of the stakeholders into the business itself. How do you do that through a particular supply chain? Let me share with you what Rallis India, among the leading agro-based companies of this country, did with their Mopu or More Pulses project. The Indian Pulses market is a 2 lakh crore market. And you'd be surprised to know that 30% of the world's acreage of pulses is in India. And yet we import 24,000 crores worth of pulses every year. And there are countries like Australia and Canada which grow pulses only for India to consume because they don't have any of the pulses they grow. And the whole problem with India is our, though acreage is very high, the kind of uh, uh, product, the crop per acreage is low. 750 kilograms per hectare. China has twice that. 
France has seven times that. So Rallis thought, why not we do something in order to ensure and encourage greater production of pulses by these farmers. Farmers were not getting into the pulse business because the minimum support prices that the government provides for pulses is lower than wheat and rice. What is the guarantee that I'll be paid well? So Rallis assured that we will purchase your pulses at a superior price, market plus price, so that you get a regular supply, a regular order for your pulses. They engaged with the farmers, they taught them how to optimally utilize the fertilizers, nutrients, etc., so that the productivity improves. They developed a very good rapport with the farmers because the farmers do not just trust anybody because their usual experience has been that they are always exploited. So the first opportunity they got was when they engaged with the government to ensure that the subsidies which the government provides reach the farmers. When they were a part of that process, they were amazed to note that the farmers were shocked when they got the kits from the government that such subsidies existed and they were eligible to get these kits. Which meant that for all these decades, the subsidy kits for the farmers which were provided by the government, by the money that you and I pay as taxes, never reached the farmers. Those were the kind of problems. They didn't end at that, they exposed them to the kind of MOPU or the Mall Pulse, Mall Pulses project success in other areas where the farmers were doing very well and ensured that they improved their productivity. Then entered another company, Tata Chemicals, and said that you take care of the back end, we will take care of the front end. Why Tata Chemicals? Among all the Tata companies, the company which has the largest customer base is Tata Chemicals. Why? Because every alternate Indian consumes a product that Tata Chemicals makes, and that is Namak Ho Tata Ka Tata Namak. That's the jingle we've all grown up with. 65 crore Indians consume Tata Salt. So they have a fascinating rural uh, retail network, and they ensure that all of these pulses with proper quality gradations, etc., are sold through these networks. And the farmers are assured not the opaque pricing system which was there in the mandis, but a transparent price system where based on their quality, they are paid at market plus prices. They branded these products, provided them as Tata I Shakti first and Tata Sampan later on. And there was another problem now. How do you attract customers to consume non-polished pulses, which are far more nutritious than polished pulses, which are actually sometimes carcinogenic and even poisonous. So they brought in a celebrity chef and tried to have the endorsement from him because only when a celebrity chef tells us that these kinds of pulses are good for us, are we willing to go for this. Through this particular project, these two companies ensured what was called the farm to fork model. Right from the time the product grows on the soils of earth, all the way through the product landing on our fork on the table, they are providing the entire value chain end to end. Effectively, 4 lakh farmers across 10 states in India benefited from this particular project. And of course, it improved livelihoods, it improved productivity. It also reduced to an extent the kind of imports that the government of India had to undertake to fulfill our pulses requirement, which is a very important source of protein for vegetarians. And above all, it also gave wealth to shareholders because this was all a for-profit venture. Let me run you through another example. This is Hindustan Unilever. I was in INSEAD in France in 2011, and I had uh, the CEO of Hindustan Unilever, of Unilever Inc. presenting uh, at the plenary session at the conference. And there I hear a hymn from the Venkateshwara Suprabhatam, which is a Hindu hymn very popular in Andhra Pradesh. Now, of course, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So I was amazed, why is this uh, gentleman playing this particular hymn in a presentation in France? Nobody understands Sanskrit here. That's when he shared an initiative which they considered was their flagship program of integrating social value creation that led to financial success. And that is what they called as Project Shakti or Shakti Amma entrepreneurial program. Now, once liberalization was introduced in India, a lot of multinationals came into India. And Hindustan Unilever was facing the heat of competition. They wanted to increase their rural reach and so they wanted to reach the media dark regions. Now, how do you do the reach the media dark regions for a company which is used to using all the uh, radio, TV, and other kinds of communications in those years? There was no social media and internet, of course. Google hadn't yet come into existence. 
in a mainstream format. So they started this micro entrepreneurship program where they realized that microfinance is a very powerful tool for empowering the entrepreneurs, but that is possible only when you have the right kind of investment opportunities. These Shakti Ammas or the Shakti entrepreneurs were rural housewives who became door-to-door -door distributors of HUL products. They were trained, transformed into business savvy professionals on how to do marketing, sales, etc. And ensured that they had an, a monthly income of about 1000 rupees. And again, if, I compare, if you compare with what I shared in the typical monthly income in the rural areas, it's almost an extra 50% income coming into the families. Not only that, this improved their status and stature in the society. Women, once they, once they started earning, had a say in the decision making in the families. It happened in Jaipur Rugs. It happened as a part of the Shakti project. And over these 20 years, almost 80,000 Shakti Ammas were providing products in 1,60,000 villages. Sometime in the last five years, they also introduced, along with Shakti Amma, the Shakti Maan project. Now, who is the Shakti Maan? The Shakti Maan is the man along with the woman, the, the, the male member in the household. He was given a bicycle. He used to assist his wife in distributing the products all over those villages. So, almost 50,000 Shakti Maans joined the fray. All of them improved their livelihood and their earning capacity. And Hindustan Unilever increased its reach in the rural areas, introduced sachets, more rural friendly products, and created a win-win situation where there was social empowerment and as well as wealth creation for the company. A fascinating example, Tanishk. All of us wear jewelry, men and women. Tanishk is today the largest branded jewellery chain in the country with almost 86% market share. A part of the Titan uh, company which was the market leader in watches. Tanishk realized in the first decade of its existence that while its employees are retiring at the age of 60, the supply chain members or the artisans who are actually designing the jewellery that you and I wear have to retire at 40. Why? Because these karigars are forced to work in ergonomically unhygienic environments with limited access to light, ergonomic seating, ventilation, etc. Consequently, they develop health issues, lung issues, and lose neuro coordination between their eyes and hands. By their early 40s, they give up their role as, caris as karigars and join as watchmen in metro cities. So Tanish decided, why not I empower the supply chain so that this art form doesn't die because tomorrow, if there are no karigars, there's no jewelry because this cannot be made in machines in its totality. You need the artistry of the human hand to contribute. They started what was called the Mr. Perfect program. I've elaborated that in my book as well on the Tata Group. The Mr. Perfect program aimed at providing these karigars the kind of ergonomics and work-life experience as their counterparts in the IT and BPO industries have. They were given uniform, they were given identity tags, they were given air-conditioned workspaces, they were given ergonomically sound seating arrangements. Not only that, 60% of these karigars come from Bengal, they are called Bengali Babus. So they were provided with Bengali food in these karigar parks where they had accommodation arrangements for stay. They were also provided with Bengali movies and DVDs and accommodation for their families to visit them sometimes in a year. When they were asked how they felt as a part of this program, they said, I feel great. I will now get better offers for marriage and I'll also be able to feel proud of my profession when I look at others who are not in this space but in the IT space. Tanish benefited also. The productivity levels improved from 750 grams a month jewelry making to 4 kg jewelry making because of the efficiency that was introduced by this kind of a change in the work life of the karigars. It always pays to look at the long term in the process benefit those who are contributing to your success and achieving success yourself in financial terms. Purpose achieved through dedicated brands and products. Here's a great example of a unique collaboration between the Danone Foods Group from France and the Grameen Group in Bangladesh. They got together and formed this Grameen Danone company, a social enterprise in Bangladesh to provide a product called Shakti Doi. 
Shakti Doi is a product which is a yogurt, dahi as we say, which is also having a lot of proteins, vitamins, minerals, calcium and other micronutrients which are very critical because almost 60% of children in Bangladesh are undernourished, malnourished. So they work towards this project and ensured that this Shakti Doi is available at a price which is almost equivalent to 80 paise in Indian currency. Not only that, in the process, they empowered the local system by sourcing the milk from the micro farmers, by engaging the local women as Grameen Renon ladies to distribute, by also having environmentally friendly making units and also taking back the surplus yogurts which were not sold. So they created a hygienic ecosystem for the local community by empowering them, not giving them doles, but also having a purpose-oriented product which was giving profits to this enterprise, which was a social enterprise using the profits for investing again in the growth of that enterprise, but also achieving a very important cause for the benefit of Bangladeshi children. So this is an example of two companies not directly connected, but having a dedicated product or a vertical or a brand for purpose orientation. Purpose achieved through commitment to society. This is one company which inspires me immensely. I have featured it in my earlier book, Win Win Corporations. It's called uh, Larson and Tubro. Their tagline is builder to the nation. Uh, there isn't a landmark in India we see which is not built by Larson and Tubro, including this high tech city building, which we see when we take a right turn for coming to the Google campus. The Statue of Unity, the Arihan submarine, the Parliament Library building, you name the project and LNT has been associated with that, including a part of the Mangalyan project which went to Mars. Why am I talking about it? Yes, they do have purpose orientation in their existence itself, but they have a purpose orientation of another kind. Here you may not be able to do something for the supply chain as a product or as a larger ecosystem. Then what do you do? You look at how you can create that through contribution to the society. Around the year 2000, it was realized that India has a deficit of three crore construction workers who have the skill in the construction space. So realizing that deficit, in the year 1995, they started the Construction and Skills Training Institute with the objective of providing, skill providing skills and contributing to skill development in this space so that those who have completed class 10 or 12 are able to join the mainstream. They may or may not join Larson and Tubro. They may join any other company or start their own small venture. But over the subsequent 20 years, they trained 5 lakh such young aspiring construction industry workers who could become independent. Some of them went to the Middle East and earn in lakhs and become economically more self-sufficient. Taking a leaf out of that, and this is an example I haven't come across in any other industry category, the construction industry itself came up with a project, and this is again a matter of pride, it was started in Hyderabad, the National Academy of Construction, which is a unique public-private partnership where all of these construction industry companies come together, the government gave land, the chief minister was the head of the National Academy of Construction, and the objective was to provide skills to people who would want to join the construction industry. Today, they have 138 centers across Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, training 1 lakh technicians every year. Their self-sustaining model is simple. They deduct 2.5% from the contractor's bill towards the government of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana so that this particular project can be sustained. Purpose orientation in a sustained fashion for the benefit of the society. Here comes a name which you all are all proud of, Google, but Google Internet Sathi. Google Internet Sathi was a project they started with in collaboration with Tata Trust. The whole objective was to enable women in the rural areas be able to use digital devices for banking, for education, for healthcare, and empower them through the train the trainers model. Tata Trust and Google both brought together their expertise, and ultimately through 40,000 Sathis, they were able to train over 3.5 crore women across 100,000 villages all over India. The outcome, more not more women with access to knowledge which will empower them in a way that they can improve the life of their families and 
also look at opportunities and avenues for themselves. This is a great example where Google may not have been able to incorporate the purpose orientation in its core business, but brought in purpose orientation by trying to help those who can ultimately use whatever services Google is providing and improve their lot. Working connections by uh, Microsoft was emulated by Wipro Mission 10X. It's another example of how Wipro empowered engineering students by making them more deployable, reached out to almost 26,000 colleges through academic collaborations so that their learning, teaching learning process in the colleges makes them not just academically sound, but industry-wise employable. Another example. I'll just run through this in a minute. We all know of this Tata T Jagore campaign. You may not be able to do all the other things I just shared, but you may bring in purpose orientation by cause-related marketing. Through their Jagore campaign, Tata T achieved it through anti-corruption, through empowerment of women, through encouraging voting in a thriving democratic system. And of course, we see these ads every single day. Haat mu bam, bimari hogi kam. This is a cause-related marketing of Hindustan Unilever where they are encouraging hygienic sanitation habits in the rural areas through this, which is a part of their products, but is also going to benefit them. I'll conclude by saying how these three things, how the examples that I shared are, can be categorized into three broad areas. These 4.25 billion people can be either the low income category, the subsistence category, and the poverty category. The low income category can become consumers of your products, as we saw in the case of giant irrigation systems or Grameen Denon. Those who are in the middle category, which I shared, that is in subsistence category, can be co producers, as we saw in the example of HUL Shakti, Jaipur Rugs, and more pulses. And then there is an example of those who cannot afford either to buy at a low price or to be a part of the value chain, they are beneficiaries as we saw the example of Google Internet Sati. I'll conclude with this example which I had shared in my first book, Soulful Corporations, which is a magnum opus on corporate responsibility. Purpose orientation needs to be taking these important steps. To start with purpose orientation because of external pressure, what are you doing for the society at large? to moving towards purpose orientation as a public relations strategy because it's going to give you a lot of benefit, to moving towards purpose orientation where it is an process within the company for ethical social and environment, for addressing ethical social and environmental concerns. And finally, purpose orientation is a core and integral part of the company's identity and existence which is based on proactive interactions with your key stakeholders. I conclude by stating that if India and the world needs to reach where we want to economically, the millennials have a fabulous opportunity to contribute by ensuring that the purpose and profits and money with a mission are integrated. We all have vision and mission statements. Very rarely do we ask, what is the purpose of my organization? Why do I exist? These are questions which have baffled seekers at a personal and professional level for millennia. If these questions become part of our approach towards our professional lives, millennials who are the movers and shakers of the contemporary world will be able to contribute through tangible outcomes, long-lasting outcomes, and visionary impact. You are the future. Let's begin today. Thank you.